Good morning. We're here to talk about cyber surveillance, cybersecurity, as Steve just mentioned. A subject never very far from the headlines. Uh, this week, particularly interesting, there are reports of a major cyber attack on the White House computer network. There are, it seems, near daily reports of attacks on banks. And lest any of us think this is a subject that only affects the government and big banks, According to the FBI, there were something like 500 million uh, attacks on financial institutions and attacks on actual just normal people like you and me, paying with a credit card at a store, going online on our phones. The FBI this month warned it's not a matter of if but when you will be hacked, have a plan. Well, fortunately, the two men on stage with me this morning have a plan. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And Morgan, I have to start with you because you made the hair on the back of my neck prickle yesterday. You were here at Ideas Forum, live tweeting this event all day yesterday, and you were finding, as I think you put it, interesting and suspicious activity on the cellular network in this room. And I should point out that you were tweeting this right around the time the National Security Advisor and the Defense Secretary were up here on this stage um, yesterday. So how worried should we be? Should we all be powering off our phones? Um, yes, yeah, so I use a special type of phone which is, is not so great for Instagram and taking selfies, but is, is reasonably good at detecting anomalous network activity. Um, and, and so yesterday, during the forum, it, it, it threw an alert which said that there was a possibility. Uh, basically, the alert was that the cell tower my phone was connected to had no neighbors. That's a, a strange thing. Um, and so it was alerting me to the possibility that this actually might be an attempt to listen in on my phone calls. Um, now, now what, what seems more likely actually is that uh, it was detecting the presence of sensors used by people who do VIP protection in an attempt to detect attacks against their assets. Um, but yeah, again, nonetheless, it was actually sort of a, a a reasonably interesting example of the, the sort of cat and mouse game and surveillance that actually occurs. And this is um, literally something you can watch on your phone, like a bar that's, yeah, that's so, I mean, shooting off the what, charts at a certain point in this What was interesting is room. my phone has a graphical representation of this, so I, I showed up at this event and there's just red bars, red bars, red bars, and then I left and walked just down the road to the hotel I'm staying at, like green, 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 green. <laughs> so I mean, it's literally this, this area, which, um, you know, if, if anyone else here had the same sort of phone, they'd be seeing the same sort of thing. I think someone important is speaking after us, so I, uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> You've been warned, all of you. Um, Dimitri, let me turn to you and, and tackle the big news uh, this week here in Washington about the White House. Their computer network uh, gets attacked all the time, apparently a significant one this week, and the thinking is this was out of Russia. Shocking, right? Shocking. I was <laughs> the Russians ask, want to know to what the president is thinking. Can't, can't imagine. No, but these attacks are occurring all the time, not just in the White House, but uh, really uh, the story that uh, has been reported over the last couple of years is that the commercial sector, the companies uh, that are building the innovation in this country, in the manufacturing sector, in agriculture, in high tech, uh, all of them have been coming under very sophisticated attacks from China, from Russia, and I'm talking about not criminal actors, nation states, the PLA in China, People's Liberation Army, the FSB in Russia, um, and they're trying to steal our intellectual property so that they can give it to their domestic industries so that they can compete better in, a, uh, in the marketplace. They're trying to steal our uh, trade secrets, um, things that, that would help them build our pro uh, pro the, the products better, things that would help them compete by um, stealing negotiation strategies for particular business deals. And it's really going on on an absolutely unprecedented scale. And when you say this is nation states. How can you tell, because it's not always that simple to, to know whether this is a government sanctioned, government approved, government organized job, or whether it's somebody who happens to be working in that country. This is actually one of the big misconceptions, I think, about this industry that a lot of people say attribution is so hard. It is hard, but it's absolutely not impossible. And in fact, every major cyber attack uh, that we've had over the last 30 years has been attributed and it has been attributed pretty definitively. Not all of them, not all of that attribution has been done publicly, but we know very well who's behind these attacks. And in fact, um, it's uh, a lot easier these days to even do 
uh, attribution in the private sector. At CrowdStrike, just a few months ago, we this unveiled... your company, CrowdStrike. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. We unveiled attribution uh, of one particular group in China that's been going after the satellite industry, and we've attributed directly to a building in Shanghai uh, that is the headquarters of the 12th Bureau of the uh, People's Liberation Army that focuses on, guess what, satellite signal intelligence. Uh, which makes sense because that's uh, the, the types of companies that they were uh, going after. And is it always clear what they are going after once they get inside the network? Sometimes it seems like with the J.P. Morgan attacks, the attacks on J.P. Morgan Chase that we've all been reading about in recent weeks, like they were just sending a signal, hey, we can do this. Well, we don't know all the facts uh, in that particular case, but uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, if you know who's behind it, you can often tell and, and understand what their motivations are, what mission space they're in. So in China, for example, we're tracking dozens and dozens of groups that are affiliated with different intelligence agencies and armed services, but they all have specific mission areas. There are groups that focus just on the financial sector. There are groups that are focused just on the high-tech sector and are working closely with state-owned enterprises in China to give them that intellectual property. So if you understand who is doing it, you can understand what their motivation is. I'll give you an example why it's important. Um, um, there was a company that was hacked recently. It was in the media. Uh, for a number of months um, that did uh, security clearances for mm -hmm. a number of um, government agencies and that information was hacked and the security claims paperwork is very extensive, right? It's your full background check, you're essentially your life story and uh, what a number of government agencies did uh, to the people that were affected is they said that you should get credit monitoring. Well, it came out later that uh, the um, organization that actually did the hacking was the Chinese military. Now, the Chinese military is not interested in committing identity theft against those people. Right. What, what the, uh, the government agents should have been telling those people is that they're now at high risk of being recruited, uh, of being blackmailed, and they should be given counterintelligence training, not credit monitoring, because the Chinese are not going to steal their credit card. <laughs> now, Morgan, you come at this from a little bit of a different angle. You are working right now not so much with institutions, whether big companies or government, but helping to protect individuals online, human rights dissidents, activists, national security journalists. You've been working with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras who uh, have risen to become household names because of their uh, involvement with Edward Snowden. And you left a hotshot job at Google to take on that project. Why? Yeah, um, so the, the, the last piece of sort of public research that I actually released prior to leaving Google um, was, was actually about the, the targeting of journalists. And, and the actors are actually the, the same as the ones Dimitri was describing, right? Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about state-sponsored actors, intelligence apparatus, and I mean, journalists are a very interesting target uh, because interesting people talk to them. So, I mean, they, they become a source of intelligence, right? Um, the, the, the research that I released showed that of the world's top 25 news organizations, 21 of them had been targeted by state-sponsored actors. Uh, the, the, the ones that had not were ones that had a predominantly sport and entertainment focus. Um, so, so you can draw your own conclusions on that. Uh, what, what, what I've seen is, is that uh, journalists uh, uh, talk to interesting people, are given interesting information, uh, attract different types of actors, and yet there's an asymmetry in this game in that a lot of corporations have a lot of funding, they can afford security teams and so forth, uh, whereas journalists, up until recently, I think, were quite unaware of the threat that they actually faced. Give us some perspective here. I'm a journalist. I'm sure there are many journalists in the audience today. If I had called a source on my cell phone in the taxi on the way here, or emailed a source, how, is, how easy is it if somebody wants to know who am I talking to for them to find that out? I, I mean, that, that, that largely depends on how well-funded your adversary is uh, and, and, and how dedicated they are. Uh, so you, you can also offset being cash poor by being time rich, obviously. Right. Uh, but um, I, I think depending on what you're working on, uh, you, you, you frequently know, you, you have an idea of what your adversary might be. Your, your risks, uh, it sort of bears to, to think about this. But I find that journalists are frequently reasonably aware. They, they just haven't had, I guess, known how to engage with security resource typically, uh, which I, I think that uh, big business, people that have regulatory incentive are actually forced by law to have audits, 
uh, engage with people in the, in the security industry, uh, actually know how to absorb security resource. Whereas journalists haven't known about this. So, so there's actually a, like a local example. Um, I mean, there's a satellite television company just outside DC that was compromised by a, a foreign government. Uh, the software that was used to compromise them was this offensive uh, intelligence software known as remote control system, very descriptive, uh, which, which enabled sort of that, enabled the remote attacker to turn on the microphones of the journalist's computers, listen to what was going on in the office, take, take screenshots through the, the cameras of, of, of the journalist's laptops and so forth. Um, you know, this, this software even works on cell phones, so it has this, this groovy invisible microphone capability, which means that someone can sort of turn on the microphone on your cell phone so you sort of act as this audio sensor as you walk around. And this um, software gets into your phone how? Well, so there's a number of ways in which they can do that. Um, there's sort of clumsier ways, uh, which is, you know, you, you attempt to trick or social engineer someone into actually installing something. So you say, this is, this is an update, this is something useful you want. Uh, there are silent methods of doing this. Uh, the, the particular company I'm talking about actually sells appliances for governments that they can install in ISPs. And one of the things they actually did was they actually waited until people watched YouTube videos. Um, and then they would actually either prompt you to update your, your flash or they would actually uh, hit you with uh, a software exploit which would silently install this software on your computer. Now, I mean, these, these are quite expensive and they require sort of coercive powers over internet exchanges or ISPs, right? And that you, you'd actually have to be a, be a government actor or a state actor of some variety and presumably, at least in this country, you would need a warrant. Um, in other countries, you might need less or more depending on their regulatory status. Um, and so, I mean, the interesting thing is that this, this software that was used to target this DC satellite company uh, is, is sold by, by Italians. Um, and documents that, that were released today actually um, on The Intercept by First Look Media actually show that they're being used by US law enforcement as well. So I mean, this, this actually goes to the commercial nature of the, the surveillance market that exists right now, is that you have software being sold by, by a European company being used to target US citizens and actually also being used by US law enforcement. This is, um, you know, I've, I've covered the, the nuclear industry for years and they talk about dual use and it sounds like this is the classic dual use. You have software that's very helpful for US law enforcement, law enforcement anywhere, tracking legitimate bad guys, terrorists and pedophiles and drug dealers and whoever else, but can also sure. in the wrong hands or without proper oversight be used to target journalists, dissidents, anybody else? Yeah, I, I think the issue here, I mean, the software is specifically advertised to uh, defeat encryption and monitor so, uh, geographically active targets outside of your monitoring domain. So they're, they're spe specifically created to, to target people that you might be interested in that are perhaps, I mean, in certain countries they have very rigorous state surveillance apparatus. Um, and so, for instance, you know, some of these people may end up in DC. How, how, how do you continue to monitor them? I mean, it, it's, it's this type of sort of targeted surveillance that's, I mean, it's, it's the same stuff that Dimitri was talking about, right? It's, it's, it's this type of espionage software, the state-sponsored hacking and so forth. But I would say that what makes this different is that these are intelligence agencies with mass amounts of budgets and they're persistent. They're like a dog with a bone. They will not let go. So if you are doing a story on the uh, private resources of Chinese leaders, and their wealth that they've accumulated perhaps for nefarious uh, purposes, I can guarantee you 100% can put money on the table that you're infected, uh, that they're mm -hmm. targeting you and uh, they will not relent until they're able to get into your computer so they can find out where you're getting this information, who's feeding you um, uh, that private confidential uh, data, from, presumably from the Chinese mainland, so that they can go after those people and bring them some harm. Let me introduce two words into the conversation. Edward Snowden. What did somebody with y'all's background and level of expertise in this, what did you actually learn from the documents that he released? What, how has it changed the way, say, your clients are doing business? <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, it, it's interesting because obviously uh, a lot of people seem, seem to have been shocked by the revelations. I think for a lot of people in the security industry that have been dealing with this for a long time, uh, what was surprising is how unsurprising it is. Anyone who would have thought 
for five minutes um, with our backgrounds on how you would do this type of surveillance activity if you had the resource of a national security agency, you would arrive at more or less the same high-level architecture. So I, I personally was not surprised by anything that was disclosed. Are you so, so, I mean, I actually disagree with, with, with Dimitri on, on a couple of points. I mean, I, I think that, that people who've been in the security industry for a long time were certainly not surprised that we have this apparatus that has massive funding and government backing. They have interesting capabilities. If they didn't, then they wouldn't be doing their jobs. Uh, on the other side of things, I think a lot of people were very surprised at the scope of some of the surveillance that was occurring on American citizens. I think that the, the Verizon metadata revelation, which was the one that showed that the, all of Verizon's customers had their, had their call records that were being handed over wholesale to, to the NSA on the Five Eyes, um, and I think that was very surprising to people. I think that, that was the, the very first one that came out, and I think people were, were actually somewhat scandalized about that, and I think justifiably so. I, I, I feel that it was probably poorly understood that, you know, um, the, the NSA's ability to spy on, on U.S. citizens on U.S. soil. I, I also think that the, the PRISM revelations, the, the uh, involvement of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. with, the, with the state intelligence apparatus was also something that, uh, the, I mean, I think one of the reasons why these could be surprising to peop someone like me, who's been in the security industry for a long time, is because in, in many ways these are legal questions, not questions of technology or capability. Um, and so I was certainly surprised that you know, the, about the sort of amount and scope of data that was being harvested from, from U.S. companies for intelligence purposes. Well, that points to, you know, one of the key points of tension that I think Snowden revealed, which is the, the relationship between companies, between industry and the government. I mean, the government, we hear over and over when the NSA talks and, and the FBI saying, cooperate with us. We can only fight cybercrime, the cyber villains, if we work together, if you share what you know with us. Do you buy it? So I, I think this is a, this is a difficult double-edged sword, right? Because I, I think that there are entities that are paid with taxpayer dollars, and although you can probably hear from my accent that I'm a New Zealander, I do pay U.S. taxes and live here. So I, I do think that it's it's the, these entities are paid to protect us online and protect from cyber attacks and that sort of thing, and, and worry about foreign spying and so forth. However we've noticed there's an economic impact, so as you mentioned before, I used to work for Google, yeah. uh, there's, there's a definite economic impact for Silicon Valley companies when uh, foreign nations know that the US government is actually harvesting you know, large amounts of, of data from, from these sort of Silicon Valley companies. So, as I said, I think it, it's a double-edged sword there, which I, is, I don't, I don't have actually a great answer to that problem. But there, there, there's no question that uh, there's a big impact on the U.S. industry, right? And it's not just in countries like Russia or China that may be outraged by uh, what's going on, but the, in Europe, for example, a lot of uh, individuals, a lot of governments are saying we're not going to do business with American companies because all this data can presumably go to U.S. government. And, and that's a real policy issue that uh, we have to address. There's a big law, uh, legal case right now in the courts uh, uh, with Justice Department suing Microsoft. And what they're trying to do um, on the merits, it, it's, it's a completely legitimate case because they're trying to get records uh, from an email account of a drug dealer that they're pursuing. Uh, the problem is that um, the data that Microsoft is holding is held in Ireland. Right. And uh, the Justice Department is trying to get them to release the data on this individual who's an American. But Microsoft is saying this data is held overseas and if when we store data overseas in, in other jurisdictions, um, if U.S. government can just uh, get access to that, then you know, as an American company, no one's going to do business with us overseas. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a real issue that I think the government is not thinking through very clearly. Last question, if I may, to each sure. of you. Um, and I'm going to quote you, Morgan. This was an interview you gave a couple of years ago to the New York Times. And you told them, I can't wait for the day when I can sleep in and watch movies and go to the pub instead of analyzing malware and pondering the state of the global cyber surveillance industry. Wasn't that just yesterday? So... <laughs> Uh. My question to each of you is, is that day ever going to come? Are we, is this the fact of life in the 21st century? We have to be aware anything that we put online in any form you know, is vulnerable. The interesting thing is that this is espionage. Espionage has been around for thousands of years. It's not going away. It's just in a new medium where it's a lot easier to do. A lot more countries have the capabilities to do so. It's absolutely not going away. As long as there's interest in your data, or your company's data, someone is going to go after it. So you have to realize it's a human problem, not a technology problem. 
and we need to start thinking about it as chess, that any move we make, an adversary is going to have a counter move, and we need to start uh, thinking a few moves ahead. Morgan? So I think I was reasonably hopeful when I said that, uh, you know, the future Morgan being asked to account for the hopefulness of past Morgan. But I, I, I think that I, I remain hopeful, as Dimitri said, it's a human problem. And I think that the, the greater transparency and dialogue that we're having around surveillance now means that we can actually have more of a say when we decide how we actually want to conduct ourselves in this area moving forward. Morgan Margaret Barr, Dimitri Alperovich, thank you both. Thank you.